Uh, okay, so, well, this is the last talk of the whole series, and this will be basically Langlands Frey and Kelly Go approach, and hopefully if we have time, I will also talk about Arthur and what he had in mind. What's that? Oh, don't, uh, don't. I, I actually told them to not do race. Okay, so let's, let me describe what they do and how it actually fits into uh, the whole language. Okay, so they're isolating the trace of the trivial representation in the geometric side and their setup is they're taking a group G just a general reductive, well, uh, semi-simple with derived group simply connected. And this is just for technical issues related to this uh, Steinberg quotient. <clears throat> they just want to simplify so that the, um, the Steinberg base is actually affine, not just like almost affine. So, all right, so this is uh, the main observation. So let me just do this. I'm going to write down a couple of things in step by step. Terms. So the first observation is the elliptic part of the stable trace formula. So there's observation. Uh, Semi simple stable conjugacy classes. and GQ. I, I'm doing everything over Q, but the result is, I believe, over a number field. Um, Semi-simple conjugacy classes over Q parameterized by, by what they call the steinberg itchen base. It's the, uh, what Julia introduced before in the lectures. It is just the space of characteristic polynomials. Just think about it as the coefficients of the characteristic polynomials. So it's like coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. So this is the map. So for each element gamma in G of Q, we just send it to the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial of gamma. Uh, let me denote this map by C. G is just any group your favorite group, S SLN if you like. I mean, I know. <laughs> this is in quotation marks. So for SLN, just send it to the uh, space of the characteristic polynomials. Huh? If you haven't, then you should ask Julia. Julia defined it in, uh, in a big, like most general setting. Okay, so the number two observation is, so for SLN, let's see. Number two observation is, well, you could put uh, geometric measures on G and this space of characteristic polynomial. So this is roughly an affine space. This Steinberg base is uh, just an affine space, so it naturally carries the measure, just the affine measure, dx, like just dxs. Uh, then you could just normalize measures. Uh, there's a net, well, there is a natural way, there is a natural way to normalize measures. Measures geometrically. And under this normalization, the integral over the fibers of this map, so let's, let's call this B. So let me de denote this uh, Steinberg kitchen base by B. And I'm going to integrate over the fiber of a point B of any F uh, dx. This dx actually comes from the measure. Such so is just a discriminant function times one half. There's the L factor of the centralizer. So everything can actually be uh, put into this measure, basically, so to speak. Stable orbital integral. Uh, this is, these are local, and now I'm talking about local orbital integrals now. 
Hence, they basically can write the whole uh, elliptic part of the trace formula as just like very geometrically, essentially, just the sum over elliptic part of the stable trace formula. So they're, they're working with the stable trace formula. I may actually uh, forget to say everything that I will say about Langlands, Frank, Hill, and the Go setting uses the stable trace formula and stable conjugacy classes and everything's stable. Because this base only con um, parameterizes the stable conjugacy classes. So for GLN, of course, there's no difference, but for uh, general groups, uh, there, is, there is a difference. And basically, writing all these orbital integrals in terms of uh, the, an integral of the fibers of the steinberg kitchen base is the analog of our step one. So maybe a remark. This is, is what we have been doing. Doing in our step one. We just didn't do it in an idyllic setting and locally, but we did it all uh, globally. Okay, so what they define is the following. So, okay, let me just see if this is actually correct. Um, I believe so. So, they define the following object. So, they define. A theta function, what they call, which is actually probably a bad notation, theta v of b will be just this integral, basically. And this is what happens, like what appears in the in the elliptic part of the trace formula. So this is the L factor of the torus. Let me write this up and then describe each of the uh, ingredients of this guy. I already wrote it up here, but let's give it a name. Okay, so this is the stable orbital integral. So it only depends on the base. This is the volume of the torus, so this T is the centralizer. Of gamma, well, of B, so to speak. Uh, we, Tasha showed that these things are all canonically isomorphic over the base field, so we can actually call it like over B. And this is the wild discriminant, which also depends on B. Okay, so that's great. So they basically write this thing down. And then they write the elliptic part of the trace formula, of the stable trace formula. As follows, as a sum over B of this theta Bs. So theta B is the product of theta Bs. So theta B is the product over V, theta V of B. Uh, so I forgot, maybe this LV is not actually involved in this fiber integral. Like, I'm, uh, let me not worry about that, but like, either you put, in, put this LV in the measure or not, I'm not exactly sure which one they take. But eventually, this LV either appears in the volume of the torus or in the measure, but they, th this is the function that actually appears in the trace formula. So let me just erase this part, maybe, because I forgot which measure normalization they actually take. <laughs> What's that? It, it could be. I'm, I will just, like, it really depends on the uh, normalization of the measure. So it either is in the measure. So the thing is, there are two different papers that they wrote. One is the FLM paper, one is the singularities and transfer, and they actually, they differ by this, putting this measure or not. 
So that's why I, yeah. <laughs> so let me, it is a little bit hard to actually keep track of measure normalizations in these papers, so let me be a little bit hand wavy if you don't mind. So either this doesn't matter and it goes in here or it matters and stays here. So in singularities and transfer, it doesn't go in here. In FLN, it goes in there, okay? Good, sorry. Actually, uh, well anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, this language starts by basically saying that in the other paper. Okay, so this is number one. So they basically write this thing down as the sum. But of course, what are we summing over now? We are summing over this base, the Q-valued points of the base, but elliptic regular. So this is not a full sum. Because if it's not elliptic regular, then we need to fiddle around with the orbital integrals. They don't make sense. Like you need to take weighted orbital integrals and stuff. So the state of functions are not really defined in that case. So we're going to come to that in a second. This is the exact same problem that I, we were discussing over here when we were saying that this M sum was not complete. The hyperbolic terms were missing. Similarly here, the hyperbolic terms are missing, or like anything which is not regular elliptic is missing. Uh, yes, yeah. Because it's almost everywhere one it's going to be, so that, uh, well, uh, well, except for the L function, up to the L value. So it will be in, like, conditionally conversion. It is, I, I mean, this thing actually is what we wrote as L1 m squared minus 4n. So it's the generalization of that guy. So maybe I should emphasize that that's a good point and a good place to emphasize. So this theta v, so remark 2, this, this theta function is basically the analog of this L1 m squared minus 4n times our theta infinity function. So this, where b is m and n in this case. I'm lying a little bit, well, yeah, you're fixing n and moving m over. So this is the, uh, the conversion between our approach, like what we've been talking about so far, and their approach. Okay. Um, so what did I want to say? Uh -huh. So what they do is they want to add these these parts, so their idea is the following. Since by this comparison, you would basically expect what their idea is, so we did a Poisson sum on M and got the contribution of the true year representation, what they're gonna try to do is a Poisson sum on B and try to isolate the contribution of the trivial representation as the main term. And wh what is the lattice, so this is roughly an affine space, so this sits inside the adelic points of this affine space, and this is the discrete lattice that they want to actually do Poisson summation on. So the difference was, of course, like, we took everything to be unramified at every finite place. In that case, this is just uh, sum over z points. It just doesn't have much of a difference. Okay, so maybe I should emphasize that. Number one, number two, number three is Their goal is, is to apply what's on on B, on B cubits. Okay, great. Now, the problems, of course, persist. I mean, these are not great functions, these are not even defined everywhere, these are like, I mean, how is anybody going to do Poisson summation over here? Moreover, the sum is incomplete. These are basically the exact same problems that we faced in the MN setting, in the uh, very classical setting they're facing. So how do we deal with this problem? Let me just once again emphasize. So we said that this whole thing satisfied a functional equation. This was our LS L1, whatever, so we regularize this whole product by introducing an S-factor here, 
And we said ls m squared minus 4n. And, well, you took my word that this thing actually was, had analytic continuation and a functional equation, which resulted in this technical gadget called approximate functional equation. So from, for what I'm going to say in the next 45 minutes, or like next half an hour, basically think of the approximate functional equation as the reincarnation of the fact that this regularized series by this introducing this var variable s, which is orbital integral times the L value times the discriminant. And I'm emphasizing, I mean this, let me just keep this, this notation. As Julia said, you could put this guy in here, but like, let me emphasize that this is here. We regularize this by putting an S variable for the whole product. The whole product satisfies a functional equation somehow. What they're going to do is the following. So their major enemy is this volume of torus. Because the volume of torus is an arithmetic quantity. As I've been getting asked over and over again, it's very hard to do Poisson summation on an arithmetically defined object because it's not defined a as a function of a real variable or anything. Like, how do you define the Fourier transform of such a thing? So what they're going to try to do is to chop this guy off somehow and do a Poisson sum on the rest of the variables. So this is the rough idea. But what they will do, okay, is they will introduce so they introduce a complex parameter S. Great, as we did. But what do they do? They introduce the complex parameter only in this L factor. So they define this theta V of B comma S to be the discriminant, the L value at S now, times the orbital integral, the stable orbital integral. So here is where they diverge. Once again, emphasis, they regularize just the volume of the torus, whereas we regularize the whole product somehow. Does that, does that make sense? And this is where things are going to differ. Okay. Now, of course, once you introduce the S parameter, you can add the hyperbolic terms because the problem was these L factors were not converging. But if S is greater than one, all of these things are converging. So you can add like a zeta or like whatever that factor is actually bringing in. So let me mark that. So number three, number four, is once they define this, they can add the hyperbolic terms, and they do. So for four, the hyperbolic terms, terms, and Poisson summation. Okay. As I just said, for real s greater than, so I should also, of course, say this real part of this complex parameter is large. Of course, you're interested only in when s is 1, but you know that's how regularization works. And for real s1, like larger than 1, it is OK to extend this. to BQ. So they basically get a sum. They, they just manually add, essentially, these terms and get a sum, not theta of B, but theta of B comma S. Okay? So this would be roughly, like in principle, the elliptic part. But of course, it's no longer the elliptic part. We have introduced the parameter S and extra terms. Okay, so now what they want to do is they want to actually apply Poisson summation. We still haven't actually gotten around the fact that 
you cannot really do Poisson summation on a discrete variable. Okay. So we just got over, we just manually added the, uh, these hyperbolic terms or like these non-convergent terms by just regularizing the L value. Okay. Uh -huh. I think so. A regular part. Oh, well, let me just see. The irregular part, doesn't this guy vanish from that, uh, that thing? But then there's the orbital integral that blows up. Um, is that actually a, let me just think. Is that an issue, though? We were just taking the semi-simple part. Because this thing just uh, parameterizes the semi-simple conjugacy classes, right? The unipotent things don't show up. For semi-simple guys, it's actually fine, I think. They're only looking at the semi-simple elements. So I'm, I was just considering the central elements today, actually. But then th we're actually in the uh, derived, derived group semi-simply connected case. So that is probably just the identity element that we're worried about. Like, would this product actually make sense for uh, a central element? It's just something. I mean, it's like the orbital integral times the L value at S times the discriminant. I think it would make sense. Um, the discriminant would be zero, right? No, no, this is actually the group discriminant. So they don't take it. So it, it would just be zero, I guess, in that case. So, yeah. So it is, I think it is well defined for the whole not just the uh, regular. Because they need the whole thing to actually do Poisson sum. They get the whole thing. So the whole base. OK. Um, well, we still need to deal with these uh, L functions. What they do is they use the following observation. So they actually attribute to J skits a part of this observation, at least, not all of it, but. By the way, maybe I should emphasize one thing. Throughout the paper, once they actually uh, introduce this S and basically say that this whole thing can be extended, they never actually look back and calculate anything about what they have added manually. They say that you know all we care about is the trivial representation. We're going to get that, and the rest is for another paper to be seen. <laughs> um, OK, so for the hyperbolic terms, what they say is they use the following observation. They use the following observation. OK, so A is the following. There exists a set, S prime, such that for all V not in S prime, we either have the orbital integral vanishing, or if this theta v of b is not 0, then this discriminant is 1. So they somehow get rid of this guy, uh, this v. And the second observation is for s prime large enough. Of course, once you find such an s, you can enlarge it. Because, I mean, anything that contains this is going to satisfy the same thing. So for S prime large enough, and it satisfied certain hypotheses, so satisfying, so large enough means the following, satisfying uh, lambda of gamma of is 1 for every root, and 1 minus alpha of gamma. V is 1. OK, so for all alpha in the root system, for every alpha root, and this lambda is uh, for every character of the carton. So for all characters of the, of the carton. They fix the carton. So in any case, this is not very important, but for S prime large enough, what one can show is with respect to this measure, the stable orbital integral of this FVB is just Q to the minus dimension of the derived subgroup uh, times 
the number of elements of the derived subgroup over the uh, residue field. So anyway, so there is a certain calculation that actually expresses it. This is about the measures. And what this implies for us is the following. If you actually take S prime very, very large, basically this guy and this guy does not depend on B. The only dependence is actually here. That is what they're doing. And in terms of this LMN, uh, this, this calculation, what's happening is, remember, we were, this L was the Dirichlet L function up to this sum over F squared dividing M squared minus 4N. And there are only finitely many Fs that divide this. So if you actually take your S to not to con like contain all of these primes that occur as prime factors of F, that should do what they're actually trying to do. I'm sorry? So statement A is there is an S prime such that if V is not an S prime and this is non-zero, then this is one. No, for all, for all Bs. So for all Bs that this is not zero, rational, yeah. Mm -hmm. Q rational. Because the thetas that they're taking, as far as I know, they are compactly supported. So they will only be supported only, like the denominators are only up to a certain point, and the discriminant will only be divisible by certain, just finitely many things. So either the discriminant will be uh, super divisible, but like then it will be out of the support range of this, or if not. But after all, if one believes in these two statements that basically gives you the following. The following simplification, well not really simplification, but the following formula that this theta of B comma S can be written as a part which I will denote by theta of, well theta of S prime of B comma S. This is the product of all these things that are in S prime times the product of when V is not in S prime, then we're getting this quantity times the L value. So Q2, well, let me just do it this way. It's cop uh, G derived of V over Q2, the dimen uh, dimension of G derived times the L factor. Okay. And then they call this, this product something. So this product is independent of B at this point, so you can take this out. For SL2, this is just a zeta of 2. Um, then they let this pi s prime, or maybe I should call it pi s prime, to be just the product of v, not in s prime, of this quantity. It's g derived of kappa v over q to the dimension of this g derived. So this thing they write as theta b comma s is this pi s prime times theta s prime or b comma s times this l value basically. So I'm going to denote this as l s prime of s comma sigma tg. Okay, so this is what they write it as. Now the important part is you want to do Poisson summation, but you still have this guy. This still depends on B. So this is fine. This pi S prime does not depend on B. That's why I took it back. So this is this product. Theta does depend on B. That's fine, whatever that is. And there is this uh, LS prime, which is just this like infinite product, so to speak, that depends on B. So what they do then is the last part. Which one? T depends on B, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I should have said this T is the centralizer of B. So T T depends on B. Yeah, that's a bad notation probably. I should have said so, but yeah. OK, so what they then use is the following. As long as S is large, this is an absolutely convergent product. So you could find, OK, so then like last step maybe is they use the following fact. So if real S is very, very large, then L S prime of S comma B is absolutely convergent. Actually, did they even take, let me just think for a second. Okay, I believe so. This is fine. Virgin product. Uh, this is great. Then what they do is, then there exists, so for any epsilon, There exists an S double prime containing this S prime such that L S double prime S B, uh, yes, minus one is less than epsilon. So this basically means the product, the tail of the product gets smaller and smaller. For any epsilon, you can actually find one of these guys. It's just like the, this just means that the absolute, the product converges to this absolutely. At the end of the day, what they do is they enlarge this set to S double prime and replace this L S double prime by one, the tail, and then just say the following. So they take this theta B S, write this as pi S prime pi S double prime times theta S double prime B S plus Epsilon, that's what they do. So, and then now B is sum, being summed over B of Q S prime. Uh, and here Q S prime is inside A S prime. So what does this actually gain? This gains the following. So we had a, now this guy is just a finitely many copies of Q P. And we're basically adding all this into finitely many copies of QP. And you just have a finite lattice in a finite place. And at each finite place, although this function has some certain singularities, they don't add up to infinity. It's just we, it only stops at S double prime. So you could do a local Fourier transform to all of these functions. Because locally, when you think about what the uh, orbital integral or L function or anything does is, I mean, it has singularities. It has jumps over tori, but if you don't add them up infinitely many times or multiply them, then you're fine. I mean, you just have finitely many singular, non-decaying Fourier transform functions. But of course, this is not what you want. You want this, you want to send this S infinity to, so S double prime to infinity, and that's what they're going to do. But at the end of the day, the moral of the story is their construction does the following, following two things different than what we have been doing. One is they regularize only the volume of the torus, but not the uh, orbital integrals themselves. So they don't put the orbital integrals. They just look at the volumes of tori. And second, they use a multiplicative truncation of these volumes. They basically chop the tail off. They essentially replace the volumes of tori, which are L values, by the finite product that is approximating the L value. And then their final value, their final theorem, is the following. And this is where things are going to get. I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, orbital integral vanishes. That's what they say. Yeah, because, yeah, the 
orbital, the functions are all compactly supported. There's only finite in many B. Okay, so now once they are at this stage, they do a Poisson sum. Okay, so maybe I should also say, okay, this is only true when you don't have hyperbolic terms. I think I missed one step. So let me just roll back a little bit. Up till this point, they do not add the hyperbolic terms. They add the hyperbolic terms here at this point. So this is why, so up till this, up till this point, they actually are on the regular elliptic part. So B is in the regular elliptic. And now that everything is finite, they just add the hyperbolic terms. Although like with S, well, with everything, not just the hyperbolic. In any case, so at the end of the day, they have a full lattice, and they do the following thing. So they have this sum over B, and then with the extra, this theta S double prime, pi S double prime, let me just take this pi S double prime out. And then they say that this is just equal to Okay, great. So what do they do? They just did the Poisson summation and in this incomplete lattice. But of course, like what they're looking at is completely different than what they started with. <laughs> like we completed the product, we regularized with S. What they want is, first of all, this S to be one. And the second thing is this S double prime to be basically everything. Like not just, we don't want to cut it at a finite level. And their main, main theorem is the following. So theorem, FLN. Yes, so uh, if you choose S double prime large enough, then this will be auto, like self-dual inside B of A. I mean, this, for BQ, actually, this is self-dual anyways. In general, like, you need to choose S prime to include everything that divides the different. I mean, this is the, the same thing that goes into uh, Tate's thesis, essentially. Because all of these, fun now, all of these things will depend on an additive character, which will come into this auto-duality and everything. But I'm just not saying a lot of things. But for over Q, we just choose the standard additive character, and then this Fourier transform with respect to that standard additive character, this lattice is self-dual, so it just is a sum over itself, basically. And the theorem is the following. If you take limit as S go to one, and then S double prime go to infinity, of this theta hat of B comma S, First of all, if S double prime goes to infinity, so and then times this S double prime, and this thing is just trace of the trivial representation. Okay, so this is a very clean statement. It is clean, but it is, I mean, I, <laughs> it's unclear what it actually gives. So let's take a moment to stare at this. Well, first of all, this is actually uh, irrelevant because as S, S double prime goes to infinity, that thing goes to one. Um, but other than that, there is, I'm sorry? Oh, sorry, this is zero. Nope, just, just, <laughs> yeah, that is zero. So you take the zero term, the dominant term, and the Fourier transform of this, like this, in the Fourier transform, you take the dominant term and then let this S approach one, which was the parameter that one was interested in, and then let this truncation parameter, this S double prime go to infinity, then one gets the trace of the trivial representation. So this is a very clean statement. Um, but then, of course, what they're left with is the rest of the terms. Like, so this is very, so let's, Put a couple of things. So remark, very clean statement. Uh, they don't do anything 
else. They do not consider the rest of the terms. The rest of terms. That's B not equal. Well, let me just actually change this notation to C so that like it's a little bit better. So C not equal to zero. Okay, this is one thing. I'm going to actually show you what happens when C is not equal to zero in a special case. But uh, before I do that, I think at this point one should be uh, a little bit worried because like we had about five lectures plus 40 minutes where I've been telling you that this zero term has the trace of this plus this additional factor and an additional other factor. Whereas I'm telling you that, well, these guys are just getting the zero term as trace of one of f. So either there's something weird that is going on, or we're doing something wrong. Or maybe these two are incompatible. Well, the thing is, these statements are both correct. And it all boils down to what we're doing, and what they're doing is basically completely, well, slightly different, not completely. The idea that Poisson summation on the uh, steinberg itchin base works, or like, you know, isolates these, at least the uh, non dominant contribution and the non-tampered term is basically the same. What is different is their truncation. So I'll try to explain in like five minutes what is going on between the difference between this and our approach. And I think a good way to do that is actually to have a chart. So I hear that charts are with visual aids. Okay, so let me do this. So comparison. So our approach, well, let me call this the approximate functional equation approach, just to denote it and the FLN approach. So what do they do and what do we do? Um, so the main difference, as I've been saying, is uh, that we use the approximate functional equation use an additive truncation. And what does that mean? We had this L1 m squared minus 4n. This was the whole orbital integral times the volume times the discriminant, and we wrote this as a sum over uh, certain things plus another sum over another thing, whereas they had a multiplicative truncation. Uh, what they did was they took this LS sigma tau g and replaced it with a uh, L S double prime sigma L S tau g. So they chop down the uh, the tail of the product, whereas we didn't chop anything. We basically wrote it. So this is not an approximation. And maybe I should have clarified: approximate functional equation is not an approximation. It's actually an exact identity. This is a little bit of a, an unfortunate name. So this is an exact quantity, whereas they actually do approximate this L value. So this is number one. And number two, which will actually explain why they're, not, they're getting this, while they're getting a little bit more, is their truncation parameter. So truncation parameter here is this set of finite places S double prime. So they're basically cutting up the product up till a certain number of primes, and then after that, they're basically ignoring the tail. And this thing does not depend, when you think about it, does not depend on the individual torus, on the individual torus. So they take the elliptic part, they fix their function, take the elliptic part, they chop off every single one of these terms all at once at the same place. So for instance, for GL2, these could have been just quadratic L functions. They're basically saying, I'm going to take the primes up to 1,000, and after that, I'm going to ignore all of the primes after 1,000 for all terms that contribute to the elliptic part. Whereas 
our truncation, which involved this truncation parameter, remember LF squared, and I said in the first lecture when I introduced, there was this truncation parameter A that we, need, we were free to choose. We chose this truncation parameter A to be square root of m squared minus 4n, whatever that was. This m is the trace of the element, and n is the discriminant of the element. So this truncation depends highly on the torus. So we're truncating each element, so each volume, torus by torus. We're changing the truncation at each torus. So this depends on the torus. Torus t. Because t is now the centralizer of the element, gamma, with trace m determinant n. Okay, so basically this is where things are going to be different. That is why these guys are getting the trace of the trivial representation while we are actually getting trace of the trivial plus more. And the last part, the last thing that goes different is they regularize, so they regularize only the L value, L, S, well, L1, so to speak, sigma TG, whereas we regularized the whole product. And I'm using the word regularized in a little bit of a loose sense, uh, the gamma orbital integral of gamma times the L. All I'm saying is they're adding an S variable just to this. We are adding an S variable to the whole thing. This our L one M squared minus four N was the product over all of these things as opposed to just the, just the volume term. Does this make a little bit of sense? Any questions so far? So these are the differences. And one more thing, actually. So here is a fun exercise. Remark number three. So, remark. So if we had played the following game, if we had chosen our A, the truncation parameter right here that we constantly chose to be m squared minus 4n, not m squared minus 4n, but just left it as a, chosen our a independent of the torus, of the torus, and then did the whole thing, just, uh, and did Poisson summation. Of course, you cannot do it because there are, there are issues with the split torus, but just pretend that you could do it. You can formally calculate the zero term, at least the dominant term, and formally calculate did, so, and formally calculate theta hat of zero, uh, and then let, so now this will depend on this truncation parameter, and let a go to infinity, what you get is this limit as A goes to infinity of this theta hat A of zero is literally just the trace of the trivial representation. So what is, what is going on here, over here is by choosing this truncation parameter to depend on the torus, we are basically getting a uh, more delicate information, more subtle information about both the trace of the trivial representation and the extra term. So, if you ask if there is any explanation why this should work, I, ha I don't know. Um, but it is pretty clear that this is, to, I mean, at least to me, that this is the right thing to regularize as opposed to just the L function, because this has a lot more information than just the, L, uh, just the volume term as it is. And basically, the, uh, all I'm trying to say is like, the reason that they're seeing only the trivial representation is because their truncation is a little bit more coarse, coarse and uh, not that fine. Okay, so 
This is all I wanted to say about their dominant term. What about the terms for C not equal to zero? Okay, this is why they did not actually do, uh, like they did not try to do the uh, C not equal to zero term. So here is a, uh, I'm gonna write down a calculation, which I had done when I was in grad school, when I was trying to do their method actually for a, for a while. Here's what happens when C is not, not equal to zero. Okay, so lemma. This lemma is Langlands. Uh, and singular, singularity is in transfer. Uh, I believe it is like lemma 3.6 of this. What is that? <coughs> Oh, sorry. Okay. But, I mean, don't, don't, this is just from Singularity's paper. Okay. Lemma 3.6. So what it says is the following. So he specializes in this paper to the case SL2 and the stable trace formula in SL2 that we have heard a lot about. In this particular case, he calculates these theta v's very explicitly. I'll tell you what they look like for a local place the following quantity, theta v of b, looks like, so here v is an odd prime. This is the following gadget. It is 1 plus 1 over qv, or 1 plus 1 over qv plus 2 over qv times the discriminant to the 1 half or 1 plus 1 over qv plus 1 over qv to the 1 half times 1 plus 1 by qv times the discriminant. Of course, like the differences between the split and non-split and ramified tori over, if, over the uh, local field. So the first case happens if I'm going to say b is split. If the second case happens, if B is unramified. And the third case is if B is ramified. And this basically means like if the discriminant function attached to FB generates a ramified, unramified, or a split extension. Okay, so two things to note on this formula. One is well, the singularities of the orbital integral are pretty clear. So they, they, it has a locally constant piece right here, 1 plus 1 over qv, and it has a discriminant piece that is moving around. So, and the thing to note is that this is not a smooth function. This has a singularity. It jumps from torus to torus. Here is the, here's the different formulas, very explicit. Now, the question is, Right. What are they doing? They're taking the Fourier transform of this function. This is a perfectly valid function. Oh, I should also say, this is zero if b is not integral, of course. So zero if b is not in zv. So this is compactly supported function. It's just singular. And the singularity is right here. It's the discriminant function. Discriminant function is b squared minus 4, I believe, in this case. Uh, So we are basically looking at the uh, viatic valuation of this thing. Is it b squared over 4 or b squared over Yeah, b squared over 4. Um, OK, so it has a singularity at plus minus 2, and the singularity is there. Now, here is the reason why they did not actually work out the c non equal to 0 term. So here is a calculation. The Fourier transform of this guy, and if you multiply again by this 1 over 1 minus qv squared of b is the following. Okay, here it comes. So this is 1 over, oh, let me do this with the c variable, cv to the 3 halves times a Gauss sum, normalized Gauss sum, 
times a chi v. This chi is the uh, chi that you're actually calculating the Fourier transform with respect to. The additive character of 2 c plus chi is worse than this. So minus 1 over q v, chi v of minus 2 c. Okay. And then, so this will depend on the parity of the valuation of C. And the first case ha happens if it is odd. This will happen if it is even plus chi V of minus 2 C. Uh, well, we are getting a C three halves, again, times our good old Klusterman guy that showed its face for like about six hours now. No, I did the calculation. And this is one minus one over QV squared. All right, so let me just tell you. Well, I had done the calculation. This is like a seven-year-old, or more than that, 10-year-old calculation, I think. Um, so this is if the P of C is congruent to one mod two, and it is greater than, I mean, you're gonna see what happens. This is if the P of C is congruent to zero mod two. If the P of C is minus one, and this is if the P of C is actually in, sorry, yeah, VP of C is greater than or equal to zero. So all of a sudden, you're getting a function, well, first of all, two things. I am going to stop in two minutes after this, and, but I wanna emphasize two things. One is, because of the singularity of this thing, the, and I'm hoping that this calculation is correct. I hadn't checked this for like about eight years, so. Uh, but you can e easily just do this calculation at home. One thing, because of the singularity, this thing is supported everywhere. It's not no longer compactly supported. As you can see, these are non-zero numbers everywhere. And funny thing is, it actually flipped when uh, C is integral, this is constant. And when C is non-integral, it starts oscillating. The oscillation depends, the frequency depends on what is in the uh, numerator of C, so to speak. So each different place sees each other. If C, think about C as coming from a global element, the oscillation frequency will depend on different places all at once. And the last thing is, this guy already appears again. This is this close term and sum. And basically, I, I believe what is going on over here is like, we are essentially, this Poisson summation is one way or the other, starting with the trace formula and lending like Kuznetsov-like formula and uh, secularity, this, this ideas are actually quite close to uh, this type of calculation. I mean, it is kind of like hinting that those ideas are very much in action here. So I'm gonna stop here. There's more to be said, but that's for another day. <laughs> Uh, so what Arthur does, what Arthur says is the following. It's like for two, I can, I think, explain it in two minutes. So remember, I was talking about the non-discrete, uh, the uh, discrete contributions that are non cospital to the trace formula. Marker, sorry, marker. And what we did was uh, we isolated these contributions in the uh, zero term of the uh, zero term of the dominant, well, the dominant term, basically. And what Arthur does is, so for GLN, GLN plus one, let's say, uh, you do a Poisson sum on this base, which is, in this case, AN, so fix the determinant. And you have these Bs. Suppose you actually have completed this whole sum and you can do Poisson sum. I'll assume that there is a Poisson sum with this approximate functional equation approach. Uh, let's do 
C here in the dual variable, so a n. So it gives a stratification of the space, this a n space in the dual sum, where the various strata actually should correspond to these uh, non-tampered but discrete contributions. So that's what he does. And the, his stratification essentially follows exactly how, the, uh, how he constructs the discrete contributions themselves. Like it goes through divisors of n plus one and for each divisor, he defines a certain subset, and that subset should, in principle, correspond to uh, the contribution of that type of contribution. But there is a little bit of uh, subtlety over there. The, so normally, when you actually classify, when, when he constructs the discrete contributions, he fixes the uh, a levy, basically, and puts various different unipotents, like you know, SL2 parameters, that fit into that levy. In this case, it's kind of like the dual where he fixes the unipotent somehow and then moves around with levies and then patches them together. So like it's, it's a little bit, so it's not like straightforward. I took this uh, Arthur, like, you know, the induction, indu inductive discrete part and like put it over there. There's a little bit of a duality going on on top of this uh, like Poisson, which is already quite a bit of a duality. That's that's what he uh, he puts. Yeah, it starts with uh, it's inductive, but exactly in terms of uh, divisors of m plus one. And what he does is uh, it starts with for each divisor, he defines a certain open subset, which comes ba comes back from uh, a smaller, uh, well, basically, like it con consists of like zeros and non-zero entries, so to speak, of certain nature. Yeah, so he's uh, he's claiming that like the, the the those part of the the strata should actually correspond to the uh, spectral terms that are discrete but non well in this case non cosmical basically. Uh, G is arbitrary up to uh, it's well they take G equals G derived so that makes it non arbitrary but and. Uh, the derived subgroup should the derived group should be simply connected. Otherwise, it's arbitrary. Yeah. This is like uh, yeah, very general. I wish. <laughs> I mean, because it's uh, it's it's a, it's very subtle. Yeah. There is one, uh, maybe, oh, sorry, one, one more thing. Uh, uh, so Akshay Venkatesh, actually, in his thesis, did this from a different perspective, from the Kuznetsov formula, not the trace formula, and there he actually isolated the uh, symmetric square lifts. Uh, but, I mean, one first gets, the isolation is as follows, one gets these limits, you calculate the limit, and then the limit actually corresponds to these dihedral representations under another duality. So it's, uh, it's a finite group Poisson sum that is ha happening as it appeared in uh, Tasha's talks. So that's, even that is like subtle. 